Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service. This is Nailsey Baptist Church. Even though we're not together, we're still family, and we can enjoy worshipping God together. I had all sorts of ideas um, for our worship time this morning based on the power of God, our hope in Jesus, strength in time of difficulties. But while we were listening to Lou last week talking about uh, Ruth chapter 2, God really spoke to me and said, no, I don't want uh, you to talk about those things I don't want a spirit of bitterness. I want to see an attitude of gratitude in my people. So this morning, we're going to give thanks and we're going to count our blessings. Let's hear some words from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.
Lord, we praise and thank you that we each have at least 10,000 reasons to thank you. We can't even begin to list them all, but we're going to try. Let's call out the things that we're thankful to our God for. I'll give you a few headings and you can fill in the blanks. Thank you for family and friends and neighbours. Thank you for our health and for the wonders of modern medicine. Thank you for our homes. Thank you that we have food in abundance. Thank you that we have a democratic government and an organised society. Thank you that we have peace in our hearts. Thank you that we have assurance of our faith. Thank you that we have the loving arms of our Father God around us. For all these things and hundreds and hundreds more, we thank you, Father God. Please help each one of us to keep an attitude of gratitude in our hearts as we go through this week. Amen. Good morning from me. It's uh, great to be able to speak like this. Thank the Lord for modern technology uh, and for people who know how to use it. Um, I bid you a, a very warm welcome to this time together. I understand that some members of Backwell Baptist Church are joining us for these broadcasts. It's lovely to uh, in it, be enabled to, to share in this way uh, and others from other churches or other places. It's terrific to be able to communicate in this way with you. I was just thinking, as Sue was leading worship there, 
uh, and talking about an attitude of gratitude, I was reminded of the story of Jesus healing 10 lepers. Uh, 10 people came to him for help and he cleansed them and sent them away to show themselves to the priests. And a little while later, one of them came back. He came back to say thank you. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for all that you've done. And that's a terrific uh, expression of gratitude that we can read about in Luke 17. But Jesus thought for a moment, and he was very pleased that this one had come back, but he thought, hang on a minute, weren't there 10? What became of the other nine? Why haven't they come back? Are they not thankful? And he goes on to talk about having that attitude of gratitude that Sue uh, expressed. And I just want to encourage us to be the one. Let's be the one in a community of lots of tens. Let's be the one who says thank you. Let's remember our blessings and remember to say thank you to our God and indeed to one another for the ways in which God blesses us through them. Just a, a thought, uh, perhaps particularly for the boys and girls, but actually for all of us, uh, because we all need to hear these things. Now, in the midst of all that is going on in our world, it's important that we turn to prayer. In doing that, listen again to some words from Psalm 43. Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me, let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Let's say together the prayer that Jesus gifted to his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And a prayer from the Church of Scotland for inner peace. Set us free, O Lord, from all restlessness and anxiety. Give us your peace and power. And so keep us that in all perplexity and distress, we may abide in you, upheld by your strength and stayed on the rock of your faithfulness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, for all your goodness to us, we praise you. Please help us to remain focused upon you and your blessings rather than the difficulties and the dangers that surround and threaten. In the midst of fear and frustration, help us as your people to be a non-anxious presence in our community. We pray for all who were most affected by this virus, for those who are suffering themselves or caring for loved ones, for those who are grieving the loss of important people, for those who are self-isolating and lonely. Be to us all a constant presence and peace and help us to know how best to reach out and support one another. We pray for key workers, for carers, for medics, for emergency service workers, for those in our food industry and others who are working hard to bring help in such difficult circumstances. Please give them energy and all that is needed to sustain and su support. And we pray for those who don't know you, or have no awareness of your love and strength to help carry them through. Help us, Lord, to share your love. Help us, Lord, to shine your light in the midst of fear and darkness. Help us, Lord, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Help us to live out the fullness of what it means to be your people. As we do so, draw us closer to the fullness of your presence and help us to be filled to overflowing with your peace and our gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me encourage you, please, to go on praying for one another as God prompts you. And please don't be afraid to pick up the phone to offer encouragement. Thank you. Now, we've been looking at the story of Ruth during these times together. And we're going to hear now uh, Ruth chapter 3 being read for us. 
One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself, and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone else could be recognized. And he said, Don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring me the shawl you are wearing, and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley, and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her, and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. As we've looked over the last couple of weeks at this incredible story of Ruth, we've seen this tale of ordinary people unravel, amidst the real experiences, the difficult struggles which they coped with. Life around us is changing very quickly at the moment, and in the midst of all the rapid change and new news that comes through, in the midst of our own struggles, it may be easy to lose track of where we've got to. So let me recap uh, briefly. In chapter one, Ruth, a Moabite, marries into this Bethlehem family. Now, Moab was enemy territory for God's people. The two regions, although not very far geographically, were highly suspicious of each other. But clearly in this case, for this family, there is some attraction because both sons of the family marry local girls. Well, all goes well until Naomi's husband and her two sons all die leaving her to fend for herself with her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Naomi struggles to do this, so she decides to move back to her own country in the hope of finding help there. Naomi is kind enough to urge Orpah and Ruth to go back to their own families, not to feel compelled to travel with her. They owe her nothing. Orpah goes, but Ruth chooses to stay and she gives a brief but fascinating little speech in verse 16 of chapter 1 which explains why where you go I will go where you stay I will stay your people will be my people your God my God and I love the warmth of that phrase but again uh, as I've mentioned before I'm challenged 
by the question it poses. Am I, are we showing the attraction of my God to others? What image of Jesus are we showing? Are we even, or perhaps especially in the midst of an international crisis, portraying this non-anxious reliance upon the love and the provision of Jesus, which causes others to say, wow, I want to make your God my God. Well, whatever the attraction for Ruth was, she willingly trusted the God of Naomi and insisted on traveling with her to this foreign land of Bethlehem. When they got there, well, the cupboard was bare. So in a land without the big issue to sell, Ruth set out to gather what she could by gleaning from nearby fields. She spent her days picking up the leftover uh, remains of any grain from the edges of the fields in just the hope of gathering enough food for herself and Naomi. By a, a beautiful act of God's provision, Ruth happens across the field of Boaz, who is uh, a man who is particularly charitable to her, and he instructs his men to leave a little extra for her to gather and to benefit from. Now, it transpires that Boaz is a distant relative of Elimelech, Naomi's husband, and from that, the important events of the book continue to flow. Within these uh, two opening chapters, then, we've seen the quiet hand of God at work. He's with the women, even in their grief and their loss. He's provided for them on their journey and in their attempt to resettle. And now this great God appears to be at work in very carefully unfolding their future. And we can see elements of this in the three individuals featured in this chapter. We can learn something of their own characters. So firstly, let's have a look at verses one to five and we can see there Naomi's initiative. The very best thing uh, that I achieved in life was finding Sue and in time persuading her to marry me. One of the best moves I made though leading up to that was to somehow win over her mum. The glorious Mrs. Jill Brown fortunately had me marked out as uh, reasonable son-in-law material a long time before I managed to convince her daughter. Uh, I guess she might even have been helpful in preparing my way. So here's my tip for any single men out there trying to win a girl over. Get her mum on your side and you're halfway there. Now, in a different way, this mother-in-law, Naomi, also helps to move things along by seeing and suggesting a way forward for Ruth. Naomi knew that Boaz was a close relative and therefore that he could be well-placed to help her and to protect them. But this is a big ask. And as a parent with responsibility to make marriage plans for one's family, though, Naomi takes the initiative to take that risk, to, to kind of push at the metaphorical door. Boaz owes them nothing. His connection is remote, and it transpires later in the story that there is somebody else who, who could and perhaps should be taking care of Naomi and Ruth. But perhaps Naomi felt the nudge of God to instigate an approach, and she is obedient to that prayerful notion. So, timing things perfectly, Naomi urges Ruth to wash and perfume or anoint herself, to put on her best clothes, to present herself to Boaz. Maybe our translation loses something here, but what we're supposed to imagine is a very special garment what we should understand is that Ruth is adorning herself as a woman in that culture would prepare herself for marriage. And Naomi is asking Ruth to make clear to Boaz that she is seeking a husband. Now, it's all a bit racy, really, uh, involving a bit of heavy flirting and skulking around in dark corners. But again, it shows that the Bible is full of real-life events involving real-life people. 
thing back to that phrase that I underlined in chapter one, where Ruth recognizes something about Naomi's God. That can only have come about because of the reality and depth of relationship which she recognized between Naomi and her God, even, dare I say, when Naomi was struggling. And it's out of such a connection that grows an awareness and openness to what God may be leading us or our loved ones into. Could it be that Naomi, because Naomi is attuned to God, that she then feels equipped to show some initiative, to push at that door which she finds in front of her? Don't forget that in chapter 2 and verse 20, Naomi had recognized who Ruth had been speaking of, Boaz. And as time has gone on, she has noticed how Boaz has been extraordinarily generous towards her. Naomi senses that God is at work. How attuned to God's leading are we? How open to being prompted or led into action by him are we? It could sometimes be that we have a sense that we should be trying something or, or speaking to somebody, even in a way that doesn't at first make sense. But as we obediently step out, seeking to be obedient and honor him, God can bless that activity and guide us on. And whatever we discover, if we're seeking to honor him, if we're seeking to depend upon him, our Father God will hold us, he will sustain us, he will never let us go, even if he changes our direction. Stepping out, though, takes courage, not least because we may have things wrong. Perhaps we will lose face or at least be laughed at, but as we deepen our relationship, as we pray more keenly for God's will to be seen in our lives, as we humble ourselves before him, God takes care of all of that. And talking of courage and humility, let's not assume that Ruth is forced unwillingly into following Naomi's plan. Accompanying Naomi's initiative, the next section of chapter 3, verses 6 to 9, show Ruth's courageous loyalty. She's running the risk of refusal here. She carries the, the danger of her actions becoming entirely misunderstood and misinterpreted. But Ruth has come to learn how important a husband's inheritance and a male heir and obedience to God are. So in the middle of the night we read, Boaz realizes there's somebody there and he's a bit startled, as he would be. We can imagine the tense whispering, the confusion as trying not to wake any of the other workers. Ruth identifies herself, and then she makes something of really quite a risque suggestion. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family, verse 9. That's a clear request for marriage. And it links beautifully to another similar expression of covenant love that we read about in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 6. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood, and as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew and developed and entered puberty. Your breasts had formed and your hair had grown, yet you were stark naked. Later I passed by, and when I looked for you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath. I entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Now this is a prophecy over God's city, God's people of Old Testament times, but the same sense of rescue and love and blessing for God's people still is, I think, applicable to those he, who he calls today. This sovereign Lord God has chosen to enter into a covenant relationship of love 
with his church. The language and terminology that Ezekiel is using is that of lovers preparing for marriage. And that's exactly what the church of today is called to be, to be the bride of Christ. And Ruth's invitation illustrates the the symbolic power of such an act of covenant as she humbles herself at the feet of Boaz whilst demonstrating her willingness to be bound to him. And verse 10 makes very clear that Boaz certainly understands Ruth's request. He appreciates the reasoning behind it, which is all tied up in this phrase, guardian redeemer. But again, it remains his choice whether to act or not. Now, he clearly knows that he's a relative, uh, but he also knows that there is someone else with a greater claim, and we'll come on to that next week. For now, though, alongside Naomi's initiative and Ruth's courageous loyalty, let's also highlight Boaz's generosity. Make no mistake that Boaz was under absolutely no obligation to help her at all. He could have woken everybody up and shamed Ruth for acting inappropriately. He he might have counted the costs of all that she was proposing and, and decided that, whoa, this is too much for me. I'm not prepared to get involved to this extent. But instead, prompted by God, Boaz recognized Ruth as a woman of noble character, as verse 11 puts it, and he chooses to act graciously. Boaz decides at once, even before the night is over, that he will investigate the possibilities of taking her and her mother-in-law into his full care and protection. Now, he could have dismissed the whole episode as laughable. He clearly understands Ruth's action and question as a request for marriage. But What will people say? He didn't, however, regard it as immoral or impertinent, but recognized that Ruth was honoring a family obligation, and he felt honored to have been asked to help. So extending yet more generosity, Boaz pours a lavish provision of grain for Ruth and Naomi to feast upon, and he sends her safely on her way with perhaps a hint of what is to come. Back in chapter 1 and verse 21, we encountered a very bitter Naomi protesting that I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. But now, almost as a side issue that's easy to miss, we see evidence of God hearing that lament and Boaz echoes her words in a much more positive way in verse 17. He says, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Naomi's empty days are soon to be over as Boaz fulfills the spirit of God's law and love, wholeheartedly, willingly showing more care more love, even than was expected. How well do we embrace God's law and God's love? We're not restricted to the Levitical regulations in the same way that Boaz was, but do we use that to stop us showing any generosity? Do we gladly reach out to help the poor, or are we reluctant about sharing or even tithing what we have with those less fortunate. Uh, And what about the other gifts, the practical gifts that God has blessed us with? Do we do the bare minimum? Or do we strive to walk the extra generous mile in pleasing God and in serving others? Such was the living faith of Boaz that he did so much more than the law required, so much more than enough. And such was the living faith of Ruth that she was happy to accept the generosity of Boaz as a gift from God. She may have been tempted to offer human explanations for all that Boaz gave her, but the truth was that Boaz was responding and modeling the generosity of our Lord. God longs to give much more than we ask for or expect. God is ready to pour out extra handfuls of his love when we most need to receive it. And sometimes he chooses 
to ask us to bless others just as lavishly? Do we recognize and celebrate God's call to reach out? Over the course of the next few weeks, like never before, community spirit is going to be needed. What are we going to do to demonstrate the reality of God's love in our hearts? How are we going to reveal the reality of his most generous love and provision? Of course, it may be that we're asked for something that we simply are unable to offer, but rather than give an abrupt no, Let's be attuned to other ways of generously blessing. As we step into all the uncertainty that lies ahead, let's deepen our relationship with God. Let's show initiative like Naomi to press into his plan. Let's remain attuned to how he is leading us with acts and attitudes of kindness. And like Ruth, let's show courage and loyalty in stepping out. And let's take on the challenge of Boaz with determination to do all we can to mimic generosity. And may God bless our efforts and activities for his glory. Let's pray together. Father God, please help us in these uh, different, perhaps difficult times as we sit before you, we Pray that by your incredible Holy Spirit, you will be speaking to us. Are you calling us to take the initiative in something? Are you calling us to humbly accept your leading? Are you calling us to mimic your generosity? Father, please help us to hear your voice, but help us to obey your calling. Lead us in ways of righteousness, Lord. And help us to see you at work in the things that we do and the people that we're with. But Lord, please help us during these difficult times to be your agents of change, to demonstrate our attitude of gratitude as we encourage that in others. Come Holy Spirit, fill us afresh and lead us at new, I pray. Amen. As uh, this time of worship draws to a close, we're going to sing in a moment the song, The Lord's My Shepherd, that expresses our desire to trust and trust in the Lord. Uh, but don't switch off immediately, because after that, uh, we're going to show a YouTube clip of a song called A Day Will Dawn. This is written and performed by a man called Colin Webster. He's one of the pastors at Cornerstone Church in Nottingham and uh, leads worship at the Keswick Convention each year. Uh, Colin wrote this song a little while ago and I was listening to it recently and just felt it is so appropriate for this time as we are swept up by concern, but we recognize God's promise that a different day will dawn. I hope you enjoy it, but first let's sing The Lord's My Shepherd. <laughs> 